So now we're on step three, which is perform the final evidential evaluation process. We're getting closer to the end. Can you feel it, guys? So step one of this is to perform final analytical procedures. And I won't explain what this is again, because hopefully you remember. If not, you can go back to your old notes. When we talked through analytical procedures, we talked about how there were planning analytics and there were substantive analytical procedures. And then at the very end, we did final analytical procedures, right? As a kind of a final review, as a catch-all um, at the end to make sure we hadn't missed anything. And if you are discovering something in your final analytical procedures that is coming as a surprise to you, uh, then it's probably an indication that you missed something kind of substantial in your substantive analytical procedures, right? If I'm going through my final analytical review and I'm like, oh, there's a big jump in goodwill balance, it probably means I, you know, did a bad job when I was figuring out which are my significant accounts because I should have picked up goodwill back then and I should have performed substantive analytical or substantive procedures on it. I should have tested controls over it. So there shouldn't be a whole lot of surprises here in the final analytical procedures. But some other things I would do here in the final analytical procedures, that is actually where I would do some of the things like compare actual EPS versus what the analysts projected. So that's one thing I would do at final analytical procedures. And that's when you would might encounter things like we were talking about at the very beginning of the course with how there's quantitative and qualitative materiality, how with qualitative materiality, you kind of want to consider things like what did the analyst project as EPS because maybe you would be over under that when you consider what was on your SAD. Number two is obtaining a rep letter from management. So we talked about this a little earlier on in the lecture because we said we would get management to rep to the fact that they weren't aware of any significant contingencies that they hadn't told us about. So that is one thing that would go in the rep letter but there's lots of other things that would go in the representation letter, right? So the purpose of the letter, like we were saying earlier, is to corroborate significant oral representations made to the auditor throughout the audit. Okay, so all these inquiries we've been making with management along the way, all these things they've been telling us, this letter is going to help corroborate them. Management is actually going to be signing it at the end of the day signing their name to these things, right? And the purpose is really to complement other procedures. It won't replace them, but it's nice, especially for things, like I said, where we don't have documentary evidence to necessarily support some of the things. Ideally, it'll be dated the same day as our report date, right? Because if management's saying things like, we're not aware of any other lawsuits that you don't know about, we would want that to be dated the day of our report, right? Not like 10 days before a report, because then, okay, what if something cropped up in that 10-day period? Well, management would be like, oh, well, we weren't aware when you asked us to sign the rep letter, but sure, we were aware five days before your opinion. Having them do it the same day as our report date kind of stops them from kind of slipping anything in there into that crack. What I would suggest is reading through the example rep letter in your textbook to get an idea of all the things the management is repping to. So it's going to be lots of little things like, hey, we're not aware of any material fraud in the organization other than you know, what might have been disclosed. They're also saying things like, we know it's our responsibility to maintain effective internal control. We're not aware of any material weaknesses in internal control. And if management fails to provide uh, certain representations, it could be a scope limitation that would result in a disclaimer. So remember how when we talked 
about this in, I believe, chapter seven. We said if management fails to make certain representations about ICFR, that we could give a disclaimer ICFR opinion. That was very much related to this. So this is the same thing. It's saying, hey, if they're failing to make certain other types of representations, same thing, we would could give them the disclaimer. Okay, step three is our review of the working papers. Okay, so this is basically just saying that every working paper, we used to say like at EY, every working paper needs at least two sign-offs. Right? And the, the, what two sign-offs mean is the first sign-off, right, is the person that actually did the work in the first place, the original performer of the task. The second sign-off is going to indicate the reviewer. Ideally, there's going to be a lot more than two sign-offs on every work paper because, for example, if a staff does the original work, a senior will be the first reviewer, then a manager is going to come along and review it, a senior manager will review it next, and then a partner will ultimately review it, and then even an independent partner may review it. But at the very least, even if all these parties aren't reviewing every, every work paper, you need at least two sign-offs on every work paper, meaning at least one level of review by somebody senior to the person who prepared it. And working papers are ultimately the responsibility of the engagement partner. Step four is the final evaluation of the audit results. Okay, so this is where we come back to our quantitative materiality and qualitative materiality assessments. So we look at our, as you know, for quantitative materiality, we look at our SAD and we compare our aggregate misstatements to materiality. If they're over materiality, we're going to need to get our client to book some of those adjustments so they don't get the qualified or adverse opinion. Now, for qualitative materiality, we need to assess whether there's anything that's material or not that could impact users' decisions, right? Reasonable users' decisions. And so that's when we kind of went back. And I believe it's the slides at the beginning of Chapter 18 that talked about this whole concept of, hey, there could be something that causes you to meet or beat EPS, even if it's not a material misstatement. It could be an immaterial misstatement but it makes you be EPS threshold. And so then it's kind of is material from a qualitative standpoint. So that's when we think about all these little things like that. Next up is evaluating financial statement, presentation, and disclosure. Okay, so this is basically our kind of assessment of all the footnotes that are contained in the financial statements and making sure that those footnotes are complete and are transparent and are not misleading. And this is when we have things like our disclosure checklist, which certainly ours at EY was hundreds of pages long. And the audit, usually somebody pretty senior, like the senior manager or the partner, would go through this disclosure checklist. They would compare it to the actual set of financial statements given over by management. And they would ensure that all the disclosures that were meant to be included in the financial statements were actually in there somewhere. And they would kind of note for each one, hey, this is on page 42 in footnote five. And this is essentially a test of completeness for disclosures. You're also supposed to be making sure there's no you know, misleading language, no non-transparent language to make sure things are understandable. The language is understandable for any kind of reasonable user. There's also obtaining an independent review of the engagement, which this step six, there's not an, a slide on it, but it's really on, it's on this slide, slide three. So an independent review partner generally comes in after pretty much all the work is done. And the purpose of the independent review partner is basically they take a couple of days. There's somebody completely independent from the audit. They haven't been around at all. They don't have much of a relationship with management. And they sit and they take a look through the most important work papers. And they basically make sure they agree 
with all the decisions made by the team, the decisions made by the partner, especially with respect to the most judgmental aspects of the audit. Last step listed here is we need to evaluate the audit client's ability to continue as a going concern. All right, and we know, kind of know about this a little bit because we talked about it in chapter 18 when we talked about the going concern audit opinion. So basically what we need to do in order to see should we issue this going concern audit opinion or not, what we need to do is figure out whether or not this audit client is going to be in business for the next year. Do we believe this client can stay in business for the, the next year? Okay, so that's what we're trying to do, figure out. So we're gonna consider things like, do they have recurring operating losses? Are they not able to meet interest payments? Do they have negative cash flows, right? Those would be very bad signs that maybe they're not gonna be able to stay in business for the next year, right? Are they violating debt covenants left and right? Are they not able to pay their vendors? We look at all these considerations and determine, hey, do we think they're gonna go out of business within the next year? If there is substantial doubt, we would include that going concern explanatory paragraph, which we know is still an unqualified opinion because we do still believe those financial statements are materially correct, but we do need to disclose to the shareholders that we effectively believe this company is going out of business. If we think they will survive for at least a year, then no need to include that paragraph, no substantial doubt. 